Inhale. Exhale. We do this at least 22,000 times a day. That is why we want you to live your best lung life. The Lung Life webinar series empowers us to live our lives and breathe easier. Lung Saskatchewan has partnered with GSK to offer a free five-part webinar series featuring key opinion leaders in their respective fields of expertise, all with one goal, for you to live your best lung life. We know that education, treatment and support are vital for lung health, whether it's to manage an existing lung disease or to prevent lung disease altogether. I have learned something new on every webinar that I've attended with Lung Sask. The Lung Life webinar series offers a wide variety of topics, including disease-specific presentations, as well as education on lung disease prevention. The Lung Life webinar topics include sleep apnea, asthma and allergies, pneumonia, COVID, and influenza vaccines, quitting smoking, and everything you need to know before you go for a spirometry breathing test. The knowledge we gain from science and research makes for a better and healthier tomorrow. It is constantly evolving. The Lung Life webinar series helps you stay informed. Do you know that one in five Canadians have lung disease? Asthma is common but serious and one of the leading reasons for emergency department visits in children. 30% of Canadians are at risk of developing sleep apnea, a disease where you stop breathing in your sleep. And of course, anyone with lungs can become infected by viruses that leave us breathless. These webinars are not only for people with lung disease, but for anyone with lungs. Knowledge is power and it can help us all breathe a little easier. To find out more about the Lung Life webinars and to register, visit lungsask.ca. Missed a webinar? Don't worry. The recordings will be on our website for you to view at any time. Live your best lung life. Visit lungsask.ca today. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Lung Life webinar, Spirometry 101, what you need to know before you go for a breathing test with Dr. Brian Graham. My name is Jill Hubick. I'm a registered nurse and certified respiratory educator with Lung Saskatchewan. It is my pleasure to welcome you and to be your host and moderator. Before we begin the presentation tonight, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are hosting this webinar on is on Treaty 6 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, as well as the territory of the Métis. Lung Saskatchewan affirms our commitment to reconciliation and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's calls to action. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. And we are so very grateful that we are able to host this event where we are. I want to start by wishing everyone a happy Lung Month. What a great way to kick off a month dedicated to lung health by supporting and helping people living with and caring for people with lung disease. Prior to tonight's presentation, we've reached out to our online support group members, as well as our patient and caregiver networks, that's you, and we asked you what you wanted to learn from this presentation. We felt it was important because this presentation is for you. And the purpose of this webinar series, Lung Life, is to help you live your best lung life. So thank you so much for completing our survey. We heard from many people. Some people had different lung conditions. Some were waiting for a possible diagnosis. Some people have had breathing tests before and others had not. So you let us know what we wanted to hear, and that was what you wanted to learn. You told us you wanted to learn 
how and why spirometry tests are done, how to best prepare for your test, what you can expect on the day of your test, and what do those results mean. So Dr. Graham has created the content of his presentation today around what you asked for. So we hope that after today's presentation, your questions about breathing tests will be answered and your confidence in having a breathing test will increase. Following Dr. Graham's presentation, we will have time for a moderated question and answer period. If you have questions for Dr. Graham, we hope that you'll ask them by simply typing your question into the software feature on the webinar. You will find this feature on the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you wish to watch this webinar again, or if you want to view any of the other previous Lung Life webinar presentations, simply visit our website, lungsask.ca, where you can view the recordings. All right, it is now my absolute pleasure and honor to introduce our presenter tonight. Dr. Brian Graham is currently a professor emeritus at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon in the Division of Respirology, Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, where he has been a member since 1976. He spent most of his career doing research on pulmonary function testing. He chaired both the Joint American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society Task Forces to develop international standards for the measurement of diffusion capacity of the lung in 2017 and for the measurement of spirometry in 2019. He received the 2020 American Thoracic Society Robert Grappo Lifetime Achievement Award, which recognizes influential advances in the use of pulmonary function testing, diagnostics, standardizations, and application that has impacted diagnostic approaches and pulmonary function testing on a global scale. So around the world, that's pretty exciting. He also received the 2021 Canadian Thoracic Society Distinguished Achievement Award in recognition of his exceptional service as an innovative leader and researcher in the field of pulmonary function standards and testing. In March of 2023, Dr. Graham received the Queen Elizabeth II Platinum Jubilee Medal for his outstanding contributions to lung health. Dr. Graham also served as the CEO for Lung Saskatchewan, formerly the Lung Association of Saskatchewan for 32 years. And I personally was so fortunate to work for him and I feel blessed to call him a mentor and a dear friend. Dr. Graham's presentation is a perfect way to kick off Lung Month, and it is also the final webinar of the 2023 Lung Life webinar series sponsored by GSK. This education webinar series was created to specifically empower those living with and caring for those with lung disease to live better. Together, GSK and Lung Saskatchewan have brought you presentations on different lung health topics throughout the year. I am pleased to welcome Marie-Claude from GSK to bring greetings tonight ahead of the presentation. Bonsoir everyone, my name is Marie-Claude Desaunier and I am the Patient Engagement Manager at GSK in the Patient Affairs and Advocacy Team. In the scope of our work, we engage with patient organizations by listening to patients throughout the life cycle of our medicine, integrating those insights into our business planning to improve patient outcomes. GSK is very proud to collaborate with Long Sask and to support the 2023 Long Life webinar series. Long Sask is providing you with accessible, practical, evidence-based information and strategies coming, coming from key leaders in their field of expertise. The topics of these webinars have also been chosen based on your feedback, which is so important to listen to in order to bring the relevant information 
information, which we hope will help you live a better long life. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you for that introduction, Jill. It's always a pleasure for me to work with Lung Sask, and I always enjoy talking about spirometry. To begin with, what does the word spirometry mean? Well, spirometry comes from two Latin verbs, spirare, which means to breathe, and mator, which means to measure. Put them together and we get spirometry, which is the measurement of breathing. And a spirometer is a device used to measure breathing. So here's the first fun fact to come along. The Latin noun spiritus, which also comes from this root word spirare, means a breath. And our English word spirit is really based on that concept of a breath. Here are the objectives for today's talk. To begin with, I'll be describing how the lungs work. And I'll be doing this at a fairly elementary level to make sure that we're all up to speed on how the lungs work before we get into the process of describing spirometry. The second point is to describe the purpose of spirometry. Why do we do this test and, and just exactly what are we measuring? The third will be a demonstration of how spirometry is conducted. The fourth point will be of most interest to those of you who are about to have a spirometry test and wondering what to expect and how to prepare for it. And we'll be giving some fairly simple instructions of ways that you can uh, prepare for that. And in the fifth point was the one that a lot of people ask about and a lot of questions we get is what do these results mean? And so after we do the spirometry test, how are they interpreted? So how do the lungs work? Well, the lungs are situated as shown here in the body. They start at the base of the neck and go all the way down to the bottom of the rib cage. We have a lung on the right side, which has three lobes and a lung on the left side, which has two lobes. And the lung on the left side is dented in a little bit because this is where the heart is situated. And of course, the heart is a little bit off to the left of the center here. Uh, the lungs are connected to the windpipe or the trachea, which goes up through the throat to the voice box or the larynx. And from there, we have passages going to the nose and to the mouth. So here's another view of the lungs inside the chest. The rib cage serves to protect the lungs, but can also assist in breathing. Uh, what's not shown here are the intercostal muscles, which are muscles in between the ribs, and they have the ability to swing the ribs up and out to expand for breathing. On the left side, we see a cutaway version of the lung. What I want to show here is to emphasize that the lung is not attached to the rib cage. It's just suspended within the rib cage. This is what we would call the pleural space or with the pleural membrane around it. At the bottom, we have the diaphragm, which is the main muscle of breathing. So that as it pulls down, it pulls air into the lungs. So how do we breathe? If we were trying to inflate a balloon, we would push air into it by blowing into it. But to inflate our lungs, nobody's blowing air into our lungs. So instead of pushing the air in, we have to pull it in. And the way we pull it in is by creating a partial vacuum around the bottom of the lungs. And so when that happens, then air is drawn into the lungs to inflate them. And in this cartoon diagram, it uses the analogy of an umbrella opening and closing so that when you pull down on the umbrella, it flattens out. And as it flattens out, it expands the rib cage, creating a partial vacuum around the lungs and that draws air in. So inflating our lungs is an act of motion. We're pulling that diaphragm down. On the other hand, when we go to exhale, we just relax the diaphragm. And when we relax the diaphragm, it turns back into this dome shape. It's like the umbrella starting to close and the air comes out. We're not pushing the air out. It's really the elasticity in the lungs that's recoiling, just like when you blow up a balloon and let it go, it deflates because of the elastic recoil of the balloon. So inspiration is active, expiration is passive when we relax. In normal breathing, we would inspire for about two seconds to get air into the lungs. And then once we relax, 
it takes about three seconds for us to passively exhale that air. So in this case, a breathing cycle would be about five seconds. Two seconds breathing in, three seconds breathing out. And that would translate to 12 breaths in a minute, which is about the average respiratory rate. We can also actively exhale gas from our lungs. When we really want to blow hard, we can use some other muscles to get that air out really quickly. And we push from our abdomen with our abdominal muscles. We also have those muscles between the ribs that we use to squeeze the air out at the same time. What does spirometry measure? Well, it measures how much air we can breathe in and out, and it measures how fast we can blow the air out. So how much air can we breathe out? Well, when our lungs are completely full, we call that total lung capacity. And so this is getting our lungs just as full as we possibly can on maximum inspiration. Now, when we breathe all the way out, our lungs don't collapse. There's still some air left in the lungs. And you can see the diaphragm is up in a big dome like this. That We've squeezed all the air out that we can. There's still some air left in our lungs. That's called residual volume. We can't measure this with spirometry because all we can measure is the difference between what you have breathed in at maximum inspiration to what comes out with a maximum expiration. And the difference between those two we call the vital capacity. And so the vital capacity is the maximum amount of air that can be breathed in or out. For a male of average height at age 25, we would expect to see that the lungs would hold about seven liters of air when they're as full as they can be. To help you visualize how much air that is, think about one liter juice containers or one liter milk containers. There would be seven of those in the space that the lungs occupy within the rib cage. Now, when this person breathes out just as much as possible, there's still 1.4 liters of air left in the lungs. And so the difference between being completely full and completely empty, which is what we measure in spirometry, in this case would be 5.6 liters. Now for a female of average height at age 60, we would expect the lungs to hold about 5.3 liters when they're completely full. And once again, if you think about that in terms of milk cartons, there's over five of them in that space. When this person breathes all the way out, she has 1.8 liters of air left in the lungs. So even though her lungs are not as big as the male at age 25, we can see that there's more air left in the lungs at the end. And this is because as we get old, our lungs become a little floppier. And just like a balloon that's been expanded and contracted many times and becomes floppy, it doesn't empty as much or as easily. And so the amount of air that she was able to breathe out would be 3.5 liters. So the next question for spirometry is how fast can you blow out? And the answer is it depends. So young and springy lungs can empty faster. People with stronger muscles can blow faster. But, and this is where uh, spirometry really comes into its own, Airway obstruction will slow you down, and that's why we want to measure how fast you can breathe out, because we want to get an indication of obstruction. This is a drawing that's used to illustrate a normal airway in the lung. So here's the wall of the airway itself. The yellow part here shows the mucus lining that's in the airway. And these dark red bands are actually bands of muscle around the airway. So in a normal airway, this space is nice and wide open, and there's a low resistance to airflow. So one of the chief characteristics of asthma is that the resistance to airflow is increased, and here's why. One of the main features of asthma is that these muscles around the lung will close inappropriately, and they will squeeze that airway and make it a lot harder to breathe, because we can see now that the opening is much less, and that really increases the resistance to breathing. So the various trigger factors for asthma, such as allergies to pollens and other dust, or sensitivity to dusts and smoke, all have the ability to cause these muscles to squeeze when they shouldn't be. And the technical word for this is bronchoconstriction. Bronco refers to the airway itself, and constriction, of course, is due to these muscles tightening around that airway. Now, if we have another disease process like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, 
there are two things that will make it harder for the air to come out. So similar to what we saw in asthma, we're seeing uh, going from an, a healthy open airway to another one which has got more inflammation and more excess mucus, which really makes it again a lot harder to get that air all the way through the airway. But the other process that can happen in COPD is emphysema. And that's where the uh, alveoli, instead of being nicely defined like this, are start losing their structure, that the walls of the lung starts breaking down itself. And that causes the lung to be really floppy. And when we push on the lung, trying to empty the air out, we end up actually closing off some of the airways. And that really, again, reduces the, the speed that we can exhale. So here's an example of how spirometry is conducted. Now the video I'm about to show you now was made at the start of the COVID pandemic. And it was at a time when we had to change our spirometry training courses from being in person to being virtual. So we had to have virtual presentations of doing spirometry. However, in the lockdown, we didn't have access to pulmonary function labs. So this was actually made in my home office and I recruited my wife, Joanne, to be the subject in this demonstration. Now, some of the things you'll notice are that, first of all, I'm not wearing any of the protective equipment that we would see in the labs now, even in the post-COVID part of the epidemic, and I'm not wearing the rubber gloves or the, the clothing cover either. Another factor is that in order to get us both in the frame of the camera, I had to sit pretty much shoulder to shoulder with her, which isn't uh, what would normally happen in the lab. In any event, let's watch this video and get an example of how spirometry is conducted. Well, we've weighed and measured you and we've entered that data into the computer along with all of your personal data. And uh, there's one more measurement I'd like to make before we start. So this is a, a pulse oximeter. It measures your heart rate and it measures the level of oxygen in your blood. And it just snips on your finger, clips on your finger like this. So if we'll just put that on your finger, start it up and just rest it against your chest and just hold it there for a moment and uh, then we'll get a stable reading. Okay, uh, so we've, we've uh, looked at all of your uh, symptoms that were in the requisition from your physician to do spirometry. Uh, there's nothing that's really changed since uh, the doctor saw you. Uh, you avoided all of the activities that you were told to avoid beforehand, so thank you. And you haven't had any respiratory medications uh, in, uh, since yesterday morning. So everything looks, looks good there. There's no reason to uh, postpone the test right now. And you're feeling fine. You haven't noticed any new symptoms or any change in your condition. All right, so uh, the uh, test we're doing today is called spirometry. And spirometry measures how much air your lungs can hold and how much, how fast you can breathe it in and out. And the, uh, the test is one that requires a really strong effort of breathing in as much as you can, blowing out as hard and as fast as you can, and then breathing back in again. Uh, it's, it's really important for us when we're doing this that we get a, a really strong effort from you. You've got to put everything you've got into it. Uh, and we're going to do a series of three blows. And we do that to make sure that we've got good, repeatable, reliable results. And so that's how we, uh, uh, so we do the test. So after we've got those first three blows, then I'll give you a medication that's called the bronchodilator. It opens up the airways in your lungs. Uh, we'll wait about 15 minutes for the bronchodilator to take effect after you've inhaled it. And then uh, we'll repeat and we'll do another three blows. So that sounds like a lot. And, uh, but I want to assure you that uh, uh, before every blow, we'll make sure that you're feeling like you're ready to go and ready to give it another try. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to, uh, if you'll just hand me back the oximeter, that's right. And I'll just enter that data into the computer. There we are. We've adjusted the chair so that uh, you can sit comfortably with your feet flat on the floor. You're okay like that. Uh, the, it's really important that you're sitting up nice and straight because when you keep your shoulders back, that allows you to get your lungs as full as possible. And uh, the other thing, when you're blowing, we're going to get you to keep your chin up just a little bit more than you would usually just to make sure your throat is wide open and you can get the, the best blow that you can. Okay. The way that this test works, the uh, sequence that we go through 
is that we just uh, start with some normal breathing. And I'll quote you just to take some normal, regular breaths. And when we're sure that everything's working fine, then I'm going to get you to take in as deep a breath as possible to start. So uh, can you just take a great big breath in for me, but keep your mouth open and then just go, okay, just relax. And so you can see that even after you've taken that big breath, it's, it's, uh, it's, you can get a bit more air in and it, and it feels a little bit uncomfortable when you get your lungs completely full. But that's where we need to be. We need to have your lungs completely full to start the test. And then when you do have your lungs completely full, there's going to be a big blast of air. I'm going to coach you to just blast that air out as hard and as fast as you can. So you get that big breath in and then <gasps> blow it out really fast. Put everything you've got into it. And uh, then I'm going to keep, uh, get you to keep pushing and keep pushing that air out as hard as you can until you get to the bottom. It's going to take you about 10 or 12 seconds to get all of that air out. That doesn't sound like much time, but when you're pushing and blowing, it can feel like a long time. And when your lungs get nearly empty, it's going to feel like to you that they're empty. There's no more air coming out. And you're going to be wondering, why am I telling you to push when there's no more air coming out? But there's actually a little bit of air coming. I'll be watching it on the computer. It's really important that we measure that last little bit. So just keep pushing and pushing and pushing until, I, until we've got them right empty. And when they are right empty, I'm going to ask you to take a great big breath back into the top again. So it'll be another big breath back in. And I'll say, coach, again, up, up, up. And then we're done that, that part of the maneuver. So uh, it, it's when, when you're doing the blow, uh, we'd like you to try to keep sitting up straight. It's natural when people are blowing really hard to lean forward or uh, and lean forward quite a bit. But I want you to keep sitting straight. So it's okay if you're starting to lean forward too much. If I just give you a little tap on the shoulder and you can, uh, uh, they'll remind you to keep, keep sitting up. Uh, so there's, I'm going to be coaching you continuously throughout all of this. So you don't have to remember all these steps that I've just told you. I'll be telling you as we go all of the things that you need to do. So uh, do you understand what needs to happen here? And do you have any questions about this? None. Okay, thank you. Uh, so spirometry is really quite a safe test, but sometimes when people are putting all that effort into it and really blowing out for a long time, they can, they can uh, uh, begin to feel faint. So if you're feeling yourself getting a little dizzy or a little woozy while you're blowing this, just stop. Just come right off the, the mouthpiece and, and we'll uh, 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 fix that up and decide whether we can continue on. Uh, the other thing that can rarely happen is that some people will, will, will feel some pain due to that. Uh, and it's usually because there's some other condition happening. But if you feel any pain at all, if you're starting to feel pain uh, in your chest or in your head or in your abdomen when you're, when you're blowing out, just stop. Just come right off the mouthpiece and, and we'll deal with that. Okay? Uh, this is the spirometer that we're going to be using. And I'm, you'll just be holding it in your right hand like that. I'm going to have a mouthpiece on. I'll show you in a moment. And uh, uh, all of the air that we want, that we're breathing, has to go through that. This is the, the mouthpiece that we use. And you can see that uh, this part here goes right inside your mouth and your teeth go past this little edge here and you have to seal your lips really tightly around this uh, part of the of the mouthpiece and the filter so that you get uh, a really good seal and we don't get any leaks around that and I'm just going to put this off and put this onto the spirometer like this there Okay, now it's really important that all of the air that we measure goes through that spirometer. We can't have anything leaking out your nose, and that's why we have these nose clips. They work just like a clothespin, just like this. When the time comes, I'm going to get you to put those on, but you can just hold them for now. Uh, so if we're, do, do you feel like we're, we're ready to give this a try? So I, the, the first thing you need to do is maybe just <coughs> clear your throat a little bit, because that sometimes helps prevent the cough. And uh, I'll just get you to put your nose clips on. Okay, now you have to point them up so that they don't get in the way of the spirometer. And can you breathe through your nose? Okay, so I'll just get you to hold that, like in your hand. Now get that right in your mouth. Get a nice seal around it. And we're going to start uh, with just some regular, normal breathing here. So just nice, easy breathing. That's it. Sitting up nice and straight, feet flat on the floor. Your chin up just a little bit. Yes, that all looks very good. And we'll just take uh, some nice, easy breaths. There we go. 
Okay. So let's just breathe out. And on the next breath in, we're going to take that great big breath in, right up to the top, all the way up. Okay, ready? On the next one then. Okay, a great big breath in now. All the way up, 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 and move. Blast it out, blast it out, all the way out, right to the bottom. Squeeze it out, get all the air out, right to the bottom. Squeeze it out, squeeze it, push it. You're doing well. Keep going, keep going. All the air, right to the bottom. And now a great big breath in. All the way up, 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 and we're done. There, I'll take the, the spirometer back. You can take off the nose clips. Uh, that worked out all right for you? No problems? You're feeling okay? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That was a great effort. Thank you very much. Now, what are the reasons for having a spirometry test? Well, there are three main areas. The first one is in the area of diagnosis. Spirometry is used to evaluate respiratory symptoms and signs of lung disorders. It's also used to screen individuals who are at risk of having pulmonary disease, to assess preoperative risk for several types of surgery, but also to assess the prognosis, or in other words, what is the expected outcome for the patient. The next major area is monitoring. And in monitoring, you would be assessing the response of the lung to the treatment, uh, to monitor disease progression, to monitor the patient for any flare-ups or exacerbations of disease, and also recovery from these exacerbations. Uh, to monitor people for adverse effects of exposure to injurious agents and to watch for the side effects of drugs with a known potential to harm the lungs. And the third category is disability or impairment evaluations in which we assess the patient as part of a rehabilitation program. You also assess risks as part of an insurance evaluation. Uh, there's also pre-employment lung health and monitoring for at-risk occupations and to assess the lung health status before starting at-risk physical activities. Now, although there are many good reasons to have a spirometry test, there are also some reasons why you might want to postpone or even cancel a spirometry test. So how safe is spirometry as a test? Well, a 20-year review of 186,000 pulmonary function tests in the largest heart and young specialty hospital in the UK found that patient safety incidents occurred in five of every 10,000 pulmonary function tests with generally low risk of harm. So that's the same as one in every 2,000 tests. And the most common occurrence in these rare incidents was fainting. So there's a couple of considerations to look at here. First of all, there was no long lasting harm from this. And certainly no one died. The second thing is that in the specialty hospital, the patients on average were probably more compromised than we would see in the usual setting. I apologize for having the next four slides that are very text intensive. And I feel a little bit like I'm on a commercial for this new wonder drug that's shown on American television stations, where about 10 seconds is spent telling you how wonderful a drug is, and then the rest of the time is someone talking very fast and telling you about all the potential side effects and all the reasons why someone shouldn't take the drug. But this is information you should know, so please bear with me. So the main reason for canceling or postponing a test comes from the fact that spirometry requires the full, active, coordinated participation of the person being tested. It's not like sitting there and putting your arm out and let someone measuring blood pressure or letting someone take your blood so they can do a blood sample. As you saw in the video, you really have to be completely engaged and be able to give a real maximal effort for this. So if the person is unable to perform the spirometry test with maximum effort, there's a risk that the results will be misinterpreted. Blowing out as hard and as fast as you possibly can creates a lot of pressure within the chest and within the abdomen and even within the head. To begin with, if someone has had a heart attack within the last week, the test would be postponed. If someone has very high or very low blood pressure, if there's a significant problem with the heart rhythm or an arrhythmia, if there's non-compensated heart failure, or if there's uncontrolled pulmonary hypertension, which means there's high blood pressure in the vessels within the lung, if there's a clinically unstable blood clot or pulmonary embolism in the lung, uh, if there's a history of fainting related to forced expiration or cough. 
Another part of it, of course, is that the pressures are also translated to the head and the brain. So uh, if there's been a brain aneurysm, if there's been brain surgery within the previous four weeks, if there's been a recent concussion with continuing symptoms, because if you try to blow and that builds up the pressure in your head, that concussion is really going to start to hurt and you won't be able to blow with maximum force. Uh, if there's been eye surgery within a week or if there's been sinus surgery or medial ear surgery or infection within one week, the test should be postponed. Of course, all the pressures are within the chest and the abdomen. So if there's a pneumothorax, uh, a pneumothorax is when some air gets in that pleural space between the chest and the lung. Uh, if there's been chest surgery or injury within the previous four weeks, if there's been any abdominal surgery or injury within the past four weeks, late term or complicated pregnancy can be another reason that you don't want to be pushing and pushing on that abdomen with all your pressure it's just not a good idea at that point. And if you have an active or suspected transmissible respiratory infection. Of course, now in the post-COVID pandemic era, there are other controls that are now in place in regard to this. If blowing out as hard as you can is causing you pain, or if you start feeling dizzy, like you might pass out, you stop the test immediately and inform the technologist. The next part of this talk concentrates on how you should prepare yourself for a spirometry test. If your physician or nurse practitioner orders a spirometry test, be sure that you understand the reason the test is being ordered. You ask whether you need to stop taking your respiratory medications prior to the test, and if so, which ones and for how long. And the reason you would ask about the medications is that spirometry can test how much you respond to a bronchodilator. The airways of the lung, called the bronchi, might be constricted, and if so, might be opened or dilated by a bronchodilator. A bronchodilator causes the muscles around the airways to relax. Your spirometry will be done when you first come in. You will then be given a bronchodilator, and after waiting 15 minutes, spirometry will be repeated. So what is bronchodilation? Well, as we saw before in someone with asthma, these muscles around the airway constrict and they get really tight and they close up the airway. And after give, being given a bronchodilator, the bronchodilator relaxes these muscles and lets them come out to their full length and that just really opens up the airway. And so we would see in this case that someone wouldn't be able to blow out nearly as fast as they can when the airway is wide open. So the reason you might be asked to withhold one of your medications is that if you're taking a medication which already contains a bronchodilator, your airways might already be open before you come in and we wouldn't notice an effect uh, or at least as much of an effect by giving you another bronchodilator. So often patients are asked to withhold taking bronchodilators before the test so that the effect of a bronchodilator on your lungs can be assessed and that helps the physician determine what kind of treatment is needed. Now, if you're unsure which, if any of your medications, you're supposed to stop using prior to the test, or for how long to stop using them, check with your physician. When you receive a reminder from the clinic for your spirometry appointment, confirm at that time which medications to withhold and for how long. Generally, it's only the bronchodilator medications, or which we often call the reliever medications, that need to be withheld. You may continue using your controller medications. And this is an important part here. If you experience breathing issues that require a reliever medication, then use it. By all means, use it. Just be sure to let the technologist know when you come in for your test the last time that you had to use your reliever medication. Now, this is a busy slide, and I just want to point out a few areas on here of what kind of medications you have and what kind of medications might be available. This chart, by the way, is available from Lung Sask on their website. Reliever medications usually have a blue color to them. That's the one shown in this column here. You're usually not asked to withhold controller medications. And for the most part, controller alone medications are in brown puffers. There are also many combination inhalers which contain both a reliever and a controller. 
and for these you may be asked to withhold medications for a day. And there are some ultra-long acting medications for which you might be asked to withhold for two days. Now this chart shows mainly the asthma medications. The next chart shows the COPD medications. And once again, the reliever medications are shown with the blue inhalers. Most of the other inhalers used in uh, COPD are longer acting ones that would have to be withheld for anywhere from one to two days. The next four slides deal with things that you should avoid on the day of your test. And the first thing to avoid is smoking or vaping or water pipe use within at least one hour before testing. And the reason for this is that the smoke or the vapor can cause bronchoconstriction in your lungs. And we've already seen how bronchoconstriction can affect how fast you can blow the air out. The next thing to avoid is consuming intoxicants, whether it's alcohol, cannabis, or other intoxicants within at least eight hours before testing. And the reason to avoid this is that you need to be very clear headed. You need to be able to understand and follow the instructions very well. And you need to be physically well coordinated because this is not an easy maneuver to do. You've got to be coordinated and getting that breath in, blowing out as hard as you can. So we need you at your best. The third thing to avoid is vigorous exercise within at least an hour before testing. And the reason for this is that exercise in some people, uh, vigorous exercise can cause bronchoconstriction. And once again, we'd want you to come into the test without any of these external factors that will cause bronchoconstriction. And finally, avoid wearing any clothing that substantially restricts full chest and abdominal expansion. In order to do this test properly, you have to fill your lungs completely. If there's anything that's stopping your chest from expanding out maximally or pushing on your abdomen, you're not going to be able to fill your lungs as well as you could, and you may not be able to breathe out as fast as you can. So make sure you dress for the test. In 2018, when we were developing the international standards for conducting spirometry, we wanted to make sure that we heard the patient's voice. And so working with the European Lung Foundation, we developed an extensive survey about spirometry that was widely distributed around the world. We were fortunate in getting 1,760 patients from 52 countries around the world who completed this questionnaire. And we used that information to really help us understand the problems and the concerns that patients had when they were doing spirometry and it also helped us then to design some of the standards to overcome some of the common concerns that patients had about spirometry. Now, in the last couple of months, Jill Hubick from Lung Sask conducted a similar survey about spirometry, albeit much shorter, that was distributed to participants in Lung Sask patient support groups. And she received over 40 responses to that survey. And thank you to everyone who participated in either of these two surveys. It really helps. And unsurprisingly, the results from the lung SAS survey were very similar to those that we found in the 2018 international survey. So what were some of those concerns? Well, the first one was about being told to blow, even though you don't feel any more air is coming out. And this is a very common one because with spirometry, we want you to really push and push hard and get all that air out. And you're really working to get the air out and you don't feel anything coming out of your lungs. And you're thinking, why is this guy telling me to keep blowing when there's no air coming out? Well, the reason is, is that the spirometer that we're using to measure the airflow is very sensitive. It can measure even that small amount of air that's coming out at the end. And that small amount of air that's coming out at the end is actually an important part of the measurement that we want to make. So one of the steps we've taken is to tell manufacturers that when they're developing the software for the spirometry systems, include a little gauge of some sort, either a digital number or a little gauge that shows the airflow so that when someone is still blowing and getting near the end, they can see they still haven't got down to zero and there's still some air coming out. So as long as the technologist is coaching you and telling you to keep blowing, keep pushing, keep pushing, they're not doing it to be nasty. They're doing it because you are still getting some air 
coming out. Blowing out as hard and as fast as you can is not something we ordinarily do and you have to put a lot of effort into it and that can make you feel tired. And it's not just one breath that we're doing. In order to make sure that we've got really good test results, we have to do at least three good blows to make sure we've got your best efforts. And it usually takes people four or five or even more blows before we get all of the data that we need. Then you get the bronchodilator and you have to do those blows all over again, another three, four or five blows. So yes, it's a bit of a workout and it can make you feel tired. But the important thing is to make sure that you get that rest in between blows so that you can recover before doing the next one. The technologist should be asking you if you're ready for the next blow before you do it. And if you're still feeling a little tired, let them know. Tell them that you're not quite ready to do that next breath because we have to have your best effort in order for it to be a good test. So make sure you've got that time to recover and you're no longer feeling short of breath before you start doing that next test. Because and so a blow, which can take up to 15 seconds, which doesn't sound like a lot of time, can really feel like a lot of time when you're pushing as hard as you can and that can leave you feeling a little short of breath. So again, make sure you've got that recovery before you do the next one. Now patients have also reported feeling rushed and that's not just between tests, that's when you've completed the test. So after you've completed the test, make sure you're feeling well and not dizzy anymore before you even try standing up. We've encouraged technologists to be well aware of this and make sure they can escort you back to the waiting room and have you sit there and rest if you wish. The next concern is feeling embarrassed. So why would you feel embarrassed just because you're doing a breathing test? Well, there are three main reasons. The first one where you might feel embarrassed is because when you do spirometry, you have to blow through a mouthpiece. You'll have the mouthpiece in your mouth for a couple of minutes or more. And while it's in there, you can have a lot of secretions. You can start building up more saliva in your mouth because your saliva glands are going to become active as soon as there's something strange in your mouth like that. And when you remove the spirometer at the end, sometimes you'll get a bunch of drool or slobber coming down your chin. Of course, that's embarrassing. So make sure that you have some tissues. And what we've included with the technologist recommendations is that they should have tissues available for you so that you're able to deal with the saliva if that becomes a problem for you. The next two concerns are due to the other things that pressures within your chest and abdomen can produce. You can consciously close your vocal cords to block your airway so that no air comes out of your lungs. And when you take a bit of a breath in and close your airways like that and push, that's called the Valsalva maneuver. And, and that type of maneuver is what you use when you're moving your bowels. So there's another fun fact about the lungs. You use, actually use your lungs also to help you move your bowels. So when you take a big breath in and you close off that airway and you really push, you're pushing against your bladder and your bowels. So people who have a little problem with incontinence or bladder leaks can have that happen when you're really pushing and blowing hard. So if you've got that type of a problem, First of all, everyone should use the washroom first. It's a lot better to do this test when you don't have that concern of a full bladder to worry about. And secondly, if that is a consistent problem for you, wear some protection. So take some pads or some appropriate types of underwear that will help soak that up. But the third thing that can happen is also an embarrassment. And that is when you're really pushing on your bowels that can cause you to pass gas. And of course, it's embarrassing when you fart in public, but uh, don't be worried about it. The technologists are aware that this can happen. They're not going to think that you're a slob because you're drooling or because you're leaking or because you fart. It's, it happens, they're aware of it. So don't feel embarrassed, be prepared for it, know that it can happen and don't let it affect your test. Another concern about spirometry tests is coughing, that you're worried that you're going to start coughing. And that, that's a common thing because just taking that great big breath in can cause coughing in some cases. And so there, there's a couple of things we can do about that. One is making sure you have some water available. 
we ask the technologists to make sure that there's water available for their patients so that you can have a sip of water before you start. The other thing that can help to avoid coughing when you're on the test is that just before you go onto the spirometer and put it in your mouth, just clear your throat. Do that little <coughs> huff movement and clear your throat and that can sometimes avoid coughing happening during the test. Another concern about spirometry tests is using the nose clip. When you put the spirometer in your mouth to measure the airflow, it can only measure what's coming in and out of your mouth. If air leaks out of your nose or you breathe in or out through your nose, the spirometer won't sense that and it won't be part of the reading. So we have to block the nose to make sure that no air is escaping that way. And though we don't use a clothespin, we use a much more comfortable nose clip. You still squeeze the top together something like a clothespin and put it on your nose and make sure it's blocked. Now, some people find that putting on the nose clip immediately makes them feel kind of anxious or short of breath. And that's because we're used to breathing through our noses. In fact, babies are compulsive nose breathers. And if you pinch a baby's nose closed, it doesn't automatically switch to mouth breathing. One of the ways to avoid that is that before you put the nose clip on, switch to mouth breathing consciously. Start taking three or four breaths through your mouth before you put the nose clip on. And then when you put the nose clip on, you won't get the, that same sense of, well, I can't breathe anymore. Another concern about the spirometry test is the mouthpiece itself and making sure you get a good seal around the mouthpiece. Now the mouthpiece is usually part of a filter and this is an antiviral antibacterial filter that we have when we're doing spirometry and it captures 99.9% .9 of all of the bacteria and viruses that pass through. It's important to have a mouthpiece that you can get your lips sealed around quite nicely. So you get a mouthpiece that fits your mouth nicely, you put your lips around this part of the mouthpiece, you try and keep your tongue out of the way underneath, and that's an important part of the mouthpiece. Now, some mouthpieces have a circular end. These are quite a bit harder to use because it's harder to get a seal around a clear circle or tubular uh, part of the mouthpiece rather than one that's got this nice flare and this lip on it. And in fact, if you're having a lot of trouble, and for people who have muscular problems that they can't get a good seal, there's also a scuba type mouthpiece that where this fits between your teeth and your lips and you bite down on here and that's a lot easier to get a good seal. And so for the small percentage of people that can't use this type of a mouthpiece, we can put an adapter on in front like this. So when spirometry is conducted, the other big question that you would have is what do these spirometry test results mean? And there's three primary measurements that we made. And the first one, remember the vital capacity is the most air that you can breathe in and out. And we call this the forced vital capacity because you're breathing as hard as you can, as much as you can. And so that's why it's called the forced vital capacity. And we measure that in liters. The other measurement is the amount of air that comes out in the first second when you're blowing as hard as you can. When this is the forced expired volume in the first second. And that's also measured in liters. And then we look at the ratio of the FEV1 to the FVC, and that says what is the fraction of air that you're able to get out in the first second compared to the full amount of air that you have in your lungs. So while you're doing the test, you'll see these curves being generated on the screen while you're blowing. Well, what do they mean? Well, let's have a look. So what I'd like to show you here is an example of a test that I just did here on a spirometer I have in my office. The first graph I want to show is volume on this axis versus time on this axis. So here we have the amount of air that I breathed out. So here my lungs were completely full. Then I started to really blast out at time zero. The air came out very quickly and then it took me a long time, almost 14 seconds, to breathe out all the way. The first measurement that we would make is to go out one second on the time axis and measure how much air came out in that first second and in my case it was just about three and a half liters. The next thing we would do is at the very end of the test, what was the total amount of air I breathed out? And that's the force vital capacity. And in my case, it was about 4.8 liters. And then we calculate the ratio, uh, which again, in my case was 0.76. And we can compare that to what someone who's my age and my height should be getting. 
And all of my results are very close to what you might predict for a male of my height and age. The next set of numbers refer to the lower limits of normal. What the lower limit of normal tells us is that 95% of men who are my age and my height would have an FEV1 greater than 2.46 liters. And similarly, 95% uh, of men of my height and my age would have a forced vital capacity uh, greater than 3.4 liters. So that would be the lower limit, and of course I'm well above that right now. The other graph that comes out is a little bit harder one to grasp, but I think there's some really nice things that I want to point out about it. And on this graph, we have volume on the horizontal axis and flow on the vertical axis. So this, this again is where I'm starting at zero would be when my lungs are completely full. And when I blow out, this is where my lungs are completely empty. Only now we've got how fast I'm blowing on it here. So this is flow and I'm breathing out really fast at the beginning. And then the flow keeps dropping off, dropping off. And as I get down to zero, then I take that great big breath in, getting back up to the beginning again. And so uh, the thing to notice here is that on the volume axis, you can see that in one second, I was out at 3.49 liters. Well, 3.49 liters here shows that most of this action, almost all of it is occurring within the first second. And then it's another 13 seconds before I get out to here. Uh, that's how much longer it takes to get out that slower air at the end. There's one more thing I'd like to show you on this graph. And this little circle in the middle is, is uh, uh, this little circle in the middle is tidal breathing. Here I'm breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, in small little bits. And usually I would breathe in about half a liter and breathe out half a liter. So when I'm sitting at rest, I'm only using this much of my lungs capacity. But you can see that if I really pushed it all the way, I've got all of this much out here. And that's because our lung has to be adaptive. Our lung has to be able to deliver uh, the oxygen we need when we're just resting and it can accomplish that with small breaths But when we're really working hard We've got a whole lot more room to get a whole lot more air moving in and out of our lungs to get the oxygen So again continuing with what do the test results mean? First of all the most important thing here is that the interpretation depends on the symptoms that the patient is experiencing currently or has experienced in the past we don't treat pulmonary function tests we treat people. It's always important to keep that in mind, that we don't just treat the numbers that you generate. We've got to be looking at the whole person. So first of all, an abnormally low ratio of the amount you got out in the first second to the total amount may indicate airflow obstruction. And that's seen in asthma that is not in control. And it's also seen in COPD. An abnormally low FEV1, FVC ratio may show a significant increase after taking a bronchodilator. And this is frequently seen in asthma. Remember in asthma, those airways have been closed by the muscles and as soon as we give the bronchodilator, they open and we would see a big increase in this. A significant increase after taking a bronchodilator is not usually seen in COPD, but sometimes it may also occur. A patient with an abnormally low forced vital capacity that's the amount of air that you can breathe in and out may indicate a restrictive impairment. And that means the lungs are either really stiff or the rib cage is really stiff and the lungs may be scarred. That's just not allowing them to expand to their full amount. But as I mentioned before, spirometry only measures the air that we can expire and not the air that's left in the lung at the end of expiration. So in order to diagnose impairment of interstitial lung disease, or other types of fibrotic lung disease, it's necessary to do more pulmonary function tests that can measure your total lung capacity to determine whether there is such an impairment. Well, that brings my talk to a close. Uh, thank you for your attention. For those of you who want more information, I recommend going to the LungSask website. That's lungsask.ca. Click on lungs, click on more about your lungs, and there's lots of good information there. Now, I think we probably have some time for questions. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Graham, for sharing 
Uh, so much information with us about what you need to know before you have a breathing test. And I also really want to thank you for taking the time to tailor your presentation to what people asked about and what they want to know. So thank you so much. And and I also have to say that you're wearing the best shirt this evening uh, for our Q&A. So thank you for that. Um, a reminder uh, that Dr. Graham's presentation was recorded tonight and it will be posted on our LungSAS website, lungsas.ca, under our Lung Life webinar uh, series web page. So you can view it again or share it uh, with, uh, with anyone you like at any time. And if you have questions uh, for Dr. Graham and you haven't already done so, please make sure you enter your questions into the control panel under the questions feature of the webinar software. Okay, so we've got quite a few questions. We'll try and get to as many as we can. And I also want to uh, acknowledge that I had several people email me questions and send questions in by the survey. So um, I will most definitely uh, try and get to all of those as well. Okay, so the first one is you mentioned in your presentation that spirometry results um, are impacted by an individual's uh, age as well as their height. But why do the technicians always take your weight? Is weight a factor in spirometry? Uh, weight's not usually, uh, it's not part of the way that we predict lung volumes. But again, uh, the important thing with uh, looking at spirometry results is to put them in the context of the patient. And knowing the weight helps the physician to assess that. And so it, it's really looking at all of the other factors that the patient uh, might be experiencing and whether there's any, been any change in weight uh, since the last time that they were seen. Uh, so it's, it, it may not affect spirometry directly, uh, but uh, especially the predicted values. But uh, if, if, uh, if uh, people are, if there's a lot of weight, it can sometimes get in the way of, of the uh, abdominal expansion. And that's something else for the uh, doctor to note. Wonderful. Okay, thank you for that great explanation. Um, that, makes, that makes sense. Okay, so I know that um, this presentation is more for general purposes and not disease specific. But there are lots of questions about what, uh, how often perhaps should someone have a breathing test done? Is it something that you have once and then you never need another one again? Or is it something that you should perhaps have regularly? So there, there's no hard and fast rules on this. Well, I guess I shouldn't say there's none because actually in uh, uh, occupational health where you're monitoring the potential effects of being in a, in a dusty environment, then there are uh, regulations for, for uh, labor standards that say you have to have a test. For example, if you work in uh, a hard rock industry where there's silicon there, including things even like gravel crushing, uh, you need a test every couple of years. People working in the uh, firefighting areas will sometimes need a test every year that way. Now, as far as monitoring disease, uh, it varies. The uh, global guidelines for uh, COPD suggest that uh, you should have, uh, for, for monitoring and following COPD, there should be at least once a year. Uh, for asthma, it's, it's quite a bit different because asthma is quite a, a, a variable type of disease. And uh, uh, certainly for both COPD and asthma, uh, the diagnosis should include, at the beginning, uh, spirometry. In fact, it's necessary for COPD. And, uh, and the, uh, uh, looking at the onset, usually it's within the next uh, six weeks to three months after a diagnosis just to see what's, what's happening. And part of that is to see the response to the treatment because once someone's been diagnosed, they'll be giving, uh, you know, giving, given a medication. And to really follow that would be, uh, you know, if you're looking at either uh, stepping up or stepping down medication, it's usually about anywhere from six weeks to three months uh, interval there. Okay, so, and to just clarify for individuals, so if they had a follow-up spirometry or breathing test done, that may help the prescribing um, healthcare provider determine if they uh, need a different medication or more medication or perhaps even less medication. Is, is sure. that what you're saying as well? 
Thank you, John. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, so this individual is asking, um, they are getting ready to go for a spirometry breathing test in the next couple weeks. They've got one scheduled. Uh, and they're wondering if they should be removing their dentures mm. when they have this test. So uh, once again, the, uh, the the practice there is is to uh, you know use this on a, on a patient by patient basis. In most of the cases, almost all cases, it's it's fine to leave the dentures in. The only time you would remove the dentures is if they're loose fitting, if they get in the way of making a seal. Uh, then then there would be a need to remove the dentures. And once again, we just told technologists, you should have a cup available to put them in. And, uh, but, but really it, it, it's also up to the patient. If the patient feels that they might get a better uh, blow or a better seal around the mouthpiece, if they can get their dentures out of the way, fine. That's what you do. You just tell the technologist that and they will accommodate that. So sometimes it might be a little bit of trial and error. Yes, yeah, sometimes it's just after that first blow, it doesn't feel right, or the mouthpiece is banging against the dentures and making it uncomfortable. Well, then, yes, take them out. Okay, okay. Uh, this individual um, has experienced a stroke and has some drooping and paralysis of their face, and wondering if that will impact their spirometry test and or if they can even get a test done. Yes, so I think the uh, once again, uh, it, it's weighing the benefit, looking at the reasons for doing the test and why why uh, the physician feels that the test would be important. But uh, there are, uh, uh, as I showed you, other mouthpieces that can be available if you've got muscular problems to try and get that good seal around the mouthpiece. Uh, there's also uh, a concern, of course, that if if someone's not well enough coordinated or doesn't have enough muscle, muscular power to get it out, that all has to be taken into account when you're evaluating the results of the test. So uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, there are various considerations that have to be taken into account. Uh, but I think that uh, by and large, the technologist should be able to try to accommodate that uh, as they come through. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Um, all right, so how come spirometry isn't done on very young children? Ah, well, uh, the, uh, in, in, in some pediatric institutions, spirometry is done on children as young as three, three and a half, uh, uh, done quite well. In fact, spirometry is done on babies by pushing them and you squeeze the baby and, and you can do uh, that kind of spirometry by, by squeezing. But again, it's the coordination. It's understanding that you have to breathe in, breathe out that way. And uh, uh, in some places, you'll see uh, uh, the the parent will actually hold the child on on their knee, and uh, rather than you know, so that there's that extra comfort level there and that extra bit of guidance coming in. Uh, in some cases, uh, the mom or dad will actually have to pinch the nose because they don't want to use the nose clips. And uh, there are other accommodations that can be made. But that's in the uh, in in certainly in pediatric uh, pulmonary function labs. Those are the kinds of, of things that uh, accommodations that can be made. So uh, and and it's, so it can vary a lot. And you know some children might be able to do it at age three. Others at age five may find it to, uh, too difficult to do. So it's variable, and again, it depends on the child. But the other important thing here, and this is true for so much in, in pediatrics is that it takes a lot more time. And so whereas in an adult uh, uh, clinic, you might be scheduling spirometry every half hour or so, it would be about an hour that you would have to look at for children. And whereas in adults, we would never want to do any more than about eight tests in a session. With children, they can do about 20 before you get one right, but they're so young and springy lungs, they don't, it, it's, it's not really that much of a problem. Okay, okay. So in follow-up to that, if if a child was treated for asthma very young, but too young or uh, and, and doesn't have the ability to do a spirometry test, once they were old enough to do one, would that be a standard practice? Uh, 
you know, again, it's going to depend on, on the person and, and the course of the disease and so on. I mean, if the person is fairly stable, the child is going along quite nicely. But the thing is that in children especially, uh, you would probably want to do spirometry more frequently because that's the point where their lungs are growing. And that's the, that's the time it would really be useful to know whether their lungs are, are growing at the right rate. And so uh, uh, it's a very quick growth time for the lungs. And, uh, uh, and that's why uh, spirometry would be more frequent in children. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that understanding of that and, and why, it's, why it maybe isn't done or is done at different ages. Thank you. Okay, so in your presentation, you mentioned that obstruction um, can be shown on spirometry in uncontrolled asthma. If an individual's asthma is controlled, would spirometry look normal? That, that can happen, and that does happen. So if you've got very well-controlled spirometry and there's no bronchoconstriction happening, uh, normal spirometry does not rule out asthma. And uh, uh, one of the one of the other tests that you that is used to uh, uh, to diagnose asthma or to really uh, confirm a diagnosis of asthma is is a methacholine challenge test is what it's called and and essentially uh, it, it's giving uh, uh, giving a, a medication that will actually cause a little bit a small bit of bronchoconstriction and you uh, uh, give that to the patient, uh, have them breathe that, then do, uh, actually we'd only measure the FEV1, we don't do the full spirometry, and looking at a decline in FEV1 with that medication, uh, that, that's gonna cause a bit of bronchoconstriction would be a way of uh, confirming an, an asthma diagnosis in someone who's otherwise has normal spirometry. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that clarification, I know there was some some confusion around people thinking that perhaps if their spirometry was normal that their asthma was gone or cured so th so thank you for explaining yes. why sometimes you see some normal uh spirometry with asthma it's it, it's yeah. it's a good thing it means their treatment's working so thank yeah. you and the, and the other part of that of course is that asthma is seasonal and if your asthma is uh, you might have might be more in in winter you might be abnormal in summer you might be normal it depends on on what are the trigger factors for your asthma and that's okay. that's the other part of it. But asthma okay. is episodic, and so there's going to be episodes where you're, it, it's going to show up on spirometry, and others when it doesn't. Okay, thank you. Okay, and one of the other questions is around the questions that they ask you: your height, your age, your weight. Um, they also ask you about race. Can you share? if results are impacted if someone is of mixed race. So for example, if they are both Caucasian and, and as well perhaps um, African-American, would that change their, their results? Well, first of all, I really don't like the word race because the, that, that is, a, is a, uh, uh, more of a political social judgment. Uh, there are no subspecies of humans. We're all right. the same species. And we're so, all the same race, yes. We're, well, not race, we're all humans. And, and so that's, uh, certainly there is racism and racism in healthcare. And that's something we really have to be conscious of and, and working against that so that uh, people can be uh, perceived as being, uh, have that social uh, uh, judgment as being of a given race, if you will, and that would uh, uh, that can and does and has been shown to affect the kind of care they get, and that's something we really have to work against. Absolutely. However, spirometry, there's uh, we're, we're, when we're trying to predict how big your lungs are, the uh, the main uh, or the biggest factor is how tall you are, and that's what we measure. We measure standing height because the 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 bigger your height, the more space you've got for your lungs, and the bigger your lungs tend to be. So right. the, the problem is that standing height is made up of three components. It's, it's the leg length, the, the torso length, and the head length. And the torso length is what we'd be most interested in. Now, uh, uh, there are uh, differences in the ratio of your leg length to your torso length. And that uh, is found to be different in people of different ancestry. And so people of 
of uh, African ancestry tend to have longer legs uh, as part of their standing height. So that people with longer legs will have, for the same standing height, will have a shorter torso and that would make, make you predict a smaller lung volume. And uh, that's one of the one of the things that's quite an area of controversy right now. It's something we really uh, we really need to find a way of predicting lung volume that doesn't involve asking about ancestry. And uh, so that's that's an area that's that's uh, uh, I think we're going to find something, but it will, it'll be the next four or five years before we really uh, come up with a good measurement uh, in that regard. Okay, thank you. That's interesting, and and I I do appreciate you acknowledging. Yes, we're all one species, the human species. Um, so thank you for thank you for that. And and you're right. We have to be very conscientious of of this because we want everyone to have have the care that um, they need and deserve. So thank you for that. Okay, so so there's some questions around. Um, the coaching that's involved in spirometry. So we were watching in your video that you were the technician and your wife was the patient. Um, and I have to say you both uh, did a wonderful job. Um, and you were really, really, really coaching your wife and very enthusiastic, um, encouraging her to take a really big breath in and to blow really hard and, and to keep blowing probably when she thought she had no air left. How much does the technician's role and the coaching play on the results? There's some questions around that. Uh, it's it's uh, it's quite a big role. In fact, uh, you know, people have estimated that it can be as much as a 10% difference, uh, 10 to even 15%, depending on on how much effort is being put into it and how well the uh, the coaching happens. I think we're getting a lot better. In this regard, because we, we've developed standards for this, and that's where things like the RESPTREC program that's offered by LungSAS really comes into play for training people how to do spirometry properly. Uh, the other part of it is that we, we're also developing uh, smarter instruments, if you will, so that uh, that that for the person who's doing the coaching, uh, there's there's uh, immediate feedback coming from the computer saying that, look, there's still air coming out, you still need to bring, have the person blow. And, and I think those parts of it will happen as well. The other things that uh, come into play is just whether that technologist is able to uh, connect and engage the person. And so, uh, you know, there are, are uh, uh, people that will come in and, uh, you know, that, that uh, hmm, I don't want to focus on a key group, but uh, uh, someone who's uh, 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 an adolescent, a teenager, uh, talking about this, you'll say, you know, we want to do this, and it's oh, whatever, you know. So you've got to still find a way to to uh, engage that person, to get them to blow out, and and that can make a big difference. And in fact, getting back to children, that's where it really makes a difference. You really have to. Uh, uh, get that relationship, and you know that well, Jill, because of your experience with, with schools, and uh, it, it's uh, uh, it, it's an important factor with that. So uh, I, I think, as from the patient's point of view, uh, recognize that the person there really is trying to help you. They're on your side. There, you you may uh, uh, feel like they're being judgmental, but really, what they're trying to do is to help you, and you have to. Uh, you know, be as engaged as they are in this test. It's not like you just hold out your arm and let them take blood pressure. You've got to be in it and you've got to do it. Okay, yeah, it's a, there's, yeah, you're right. It's a team almost, hey, the patient yeah. and the technician. Thank you. Okay, um, you, you mentioned that you, in spirometry, you aim for three really good blows. How come... Sometimes it takes m many more than that. How does the te technician decide that? And when do they decide enough's enough? So the, the uh, uh, often if someone's just coming in from the first time, they're, they're, it's a learning experience for them. And they don't really come in. They might be even just be a little anxious. They're not getting that full breath in. They might uh, quit before they should. All of those sorts of things can come into play. But to really be sure 
that we're getting the uh, uh, the uh, good measurements. They have to be repeatable. We want to see that we're getting the same answer uh, uh, within about 150 milliliters of air coming out. That's that's a pretty tight tolerance. We want to see that happening uh, on those on those measurements. And so uh, it can take a while. People sometimes will not quite grasp what what needs to be done, or they'll uh, you know. Uh, perhaps stop blowing, perhaps something will happen that they, they don't quite get all the air out, they might cough part way through. All of those things will come into play to say that, you know, we need to do another test. But we really rarely would go beyond eight tests uh, in adults. In children, we do, but in, in adults, uh, it, it would rarely go beyond that amount. And that's because by that point, you're too tired. They get a really good blowout, and so we just take the data that's there. And in fact, one of the other things that we have in the uh, looking at interpreting the lung tests is that we have uh, uh, one indication that if, if it's a it's a grade A test, everything's right. You can really hang your hat on those results. But if if you don't get that, you still can get some usable data, and you can say, well, the person can blow out at least this much. That at least tells us something. And that's what we try to do so, so that when the patient's in, even if everything doesn't go exactly right, we can probably still get some useful information out. And that's why you should keep trying, keep pushing, and see what you can do. Okay, so consistency is key. So if the technician asks you to do it again, um, that's, that's just a normal part of the test and not yes. to be too concerned about that. Yeah. And, okay. And it's, it's, and it's really not the technician the, the technician is using the actual data from the computer to decide. Right. And so the, the, uh, uh, the tolerances are specified in there so that as soon as we get two breaths that, are, that match or three, then, then that's where it's coming from. It's not somebody just looking and saying, oh, I think you should do another one. No, it's, it's right. based on, on the results. Right, okay, very good. Um, uh, there's a question around if you have a flare up, whether it be asthma, COPD, um, and you end up in a merge, would you ever anticipate having a breathing test in the emergency department? Or is that not somewhere where you would see that happen? Well, unfortunately, our emergency departments are hopefully not in a steady state right now because they're very busy. People are not even being seen. Uh, there's, there may well not be enough time to do this, and uh, that's that's one of the one of the aspects that that we have to be cognizant of. And so, if someone's coming in with breathing difficulties, the first thing to do is to try and relieve that. And rather than saying, rather than measuring, you know, uh, what's going on in your lungs, obviously there's something wrong. You don't need the spirometry to tell you that this person's gasping for breath. You need to get them breathing again, and so that's the priority. And uh, maybe, and once once you've got over that acute phase, then you can start considering. Well, should we be doing some spirometry to measure what's going on in the lungs? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, that's that's a great explanation. I think that helps people prepare if they're ever in that situation. Um, that that's really great. So um, that is all the time we have. Uh, this evening. Um, thank you to everyone for all your great questions and thank you Dr. Graham for taking the time to answer our questions and to spend your evening with us and to prepare a presentation that really was was catered to what we all wanted to know. So thank you so much. Um, I want to remind everyone that this presentation including the question and answer period was recorded. It will be posted on our website lungsas.ca shortly, as well as an email will go out with the link to this recording to all those that registered. And I also want to just thank our sponsors again, GSK, for making this possible and for sponsoring the Lung Life webinar series. This is the third year um, of the Lung Life webinar series, and this was such a wonderful way to wrap up uh, the series. Uh, and, and going forward, uh, if you want to learn about upcoming webinars, if you want to watch previous ones, or if you want to join our patient support groups, we'd love to have you. 
uh, just check out our website at lungsask.ca. So on that note, um, I hope everyone has a very happy lung month. And thank you all for joining tonight. Uh, if you have any other um, questions, feel free to email or reach out to LungSask. Uh, we'd be happy to answer them if we didn't get to all of them uh, tonight. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Take care and have a wonderful evening.